Welcome to episode 38 of Ping, a Firewalls.com podcast, a bi-weekly look at cybersecurity, including interviews, news, expert tips, and the latest trends. I'm Kevin Baxter, and I'm joined by my Firewalls.com colleague, Andrew Harmon. Hello. Hey, Andrew. As we tackle a different featured topic each episode. New ones are normally out every other Wednesday, so subscribe or follow on your favorite podcasting platform to get the latest first. Please do rate and review us and drop us a line at any time at podcast at firewalls.com. As always, thanks for listening, and now it's time to introduce our featured topic for this episode. Super Bowl Sunday is February 7th, and the burning questions on everyone's minds leading up to the game are obviously about who's going to win, who will get the MVP trophy, what are the best commercials, what am I going to eat, all of those things, right? Well, of course not. It's cybersecurity, and if it's not, it should be. Because just as with any other major event that draws public attention, hackers have Super Bowl Sunday circled on their calendar. For this year's event, the Super Bowl host committee in Tampa is taking cyber concerns to heart, designating ReliaQuest, a Tampa Bay-based company, as an official cybersecurity partner. In honor of both the big game and network security, Andrew, I've cooked up a special quiz just for you that draws a little from column A and a little from column B. Pretty excited? Oh, of course. (laughs) If you get them all right, you don't get your hands on the Lombardi trophy or a new car like the MVP does, but you will get the satisfaction of knowing that you nailed it. And uh, that's just as important. Better than any car, really. Yeah. And the respect of your peers and all of the listeners out there. Just so many things that you'll get. Yeah. All right. So it's five questions. Didn't want to make it too crazy long, but these are all sort of themed either around cybersecurity and the Super Bowl or NFL. Just kind of get your mind in that football slash cybersecurity mode. That's where my mind's been (laughs) for months now. Yeah. All right, so question number one. How many NFL and uh, team social media accounts were hacked before last year's Super Bowl? Ooh, um, I think it was seven. It was actually uh, about half of the NFL teams, about 15 teams were affected, including the two participants in the Super Bowl. Kansas City and San Francisco last year and the league's own social media. So this one was featured on Ping episode. And if you can get the episode number right, I'll still give you credit for the question. Uh, That is episode 14. Very close. 12. Yeah. So the hack was by the Our Mine group, which posted similar content across all of their platforms. I think you might remember the eloquent content that was uh, posted on there, basically just asking people to sign up for our mine. It said, hi, we're back. We are here to show people that everything is hackable. To improve your account security, contact us. And then there's a contact email address on there. I'm sure they got lots of clients off of that hack. I wonder if they'll be back this year. I don't know. They The incident happened in January, so it was a little before the Super Bowl of 2020. So maybe they're waiting, maybe biding their time, or maybe they're going to go after some different sports league this time. But. Maybe they'll interrupt the halftime show to say, we're back again. Yeah. And then what would the poor weekend do at that point? <laughs> or would you say, what would poor the weekend do at that point? I'm uh, not, not sure. sure the grammar on that one. Yeah. I have to pluralize it would be an interesting question, too. All right. So... I think you kind of had the gist of that question. That one was one that we have covered before. This one is related to one of the actual participating players. So, what popular operating system came out when Tom Brady took over as starting quarterback for the Patriots, which was also the year of his first Super Bowl? Uh, I'm going to go with cuneiform on stone tablets. (laughs) (laughs) Let's see. Uh, Okay, hold on. Let me think. Um... Windows 98? He was not quite that far back. It was Windows XP, yes. So uh, that was released in October of 2001, which was right around when Brady replaced longtime Patriots starter Drew Bledsoe after Bledsoe got uh, pretty seriously injured. And so uh, did you know that as of October of 2020, 19 years later, 
still about 1% of Windows PCs do run XP. So (laughs) in fact, now here's a really fun fact. According to StatCounter, approximately 40% of desktops in Armenia still run XP. They must really rely on it, I guess. (laughs) It's an interesting stat. Yeah, Microsoft ended support for Windows XP back in 2014. But uh, yeah, I thought that was an interesting one, as uh, XP did have quite a run. A pretty widespread run, and it still has a couple of footprints here and there. I'd say it's still got a run going, just in one country specifically. Yeah, maybe more of a walk at this point, but it's still there. (laughs) All right, question number three. What do cybersecurity experts agree is a key attack vector for hackers? I did not word this very well. (laughs) For hackers as they target football fans. So again, what do cybersecurity experts agree is a key attack vector for hackers as they target football fans? And hint, it does have to do with watching the game. Hmm. Streaming services on uh, mobile devices, maybe specifically. Streaming in general, actually. We'll give you credit for that one. So experts say millions of fans will be looking to stream the game and will type some variation of free Super Bowl into the Googles to find a place to get a feed. And uh, the problem with that is hackers know that they'll be doing that too. And many of the search results will include pirated links chock full of malware that may even not get you the actual game broadcast. But even if they do get you the game broadcast, you'll be getting a lot more than you bargained for in that regard. So the Super Bowl is on CBS this year. So uh, either a digital antenna if you're in range of the broadcast or maybe the CBS All Access app. Maybe try and hop on a free trial if you can, if you uh, don't normally use that one. That will get you the game. So, uh, So don't Google free Super Bowl. No, you can Google it, but don't click on anything if you actually get there. So just some other major cybersecurity concerns around the Super Bowl, traditionally, are online sales of fake memorabilia and tickets. Probably a little less of a concern this time, though there are some seats available, I believe about a third of capacity at Raymond James Stadium in Tampa. Another one is man-in-the-middle attacks targeting the stadium's Wi-Fi. So again, there will be people there, and there will also be plenty of uh, volunteers and workers there and and things of that nature. So that's another one to look out for with public Wi-Fi. Compromised in-person payment systems, again, because there will be people buying things there. They have a lot of electronic payment systems. That's one of the big keys for why the cybersecurity company is involved this year. Online volunteer applications were probably mostly past that point now, but they were taking volunteer applications online. So if those got compromised again, that could be a problem. And of course, our good old friends with any major event, phishing emails that are related to, uh, in this case, the Super Bowl. So anything that you might be getting that it could be maybe illegitimate gambling stuff or Uh, purchases of memorabilia, things like that, anything offering free tickets or a free trip or any of that stuff, watch out for in your inbox. And based on the uh, the theme of Raymond James Stadium, I would expect piracy to be a pretty big issue this year. (laughs) Yeah, uh, they'll fire the cannon. Uh, I don't know if they're going to fire the cannon when the Bucks score this time, because that's uh, normally a thing. And it's uh, very unusual that the home team is actually uh, playing in the Super Bowl. In fact, it's never happened before. Maybe they'll just fire the cannon after every play. Yeah. That won't get old. <laughs> All right. Question number four. What was the major cyber worry surrounding this year's NFL draft, or the 2020 NFL draft, I should say, which was the first ever to be done remotely? And uh, again, bonus points if you can name the episode number or the coach who was primarily involved with the concerns. I do remember this story, and I believe it was one of the hard balls. Um, yes. And uh, I believe it was hackers sort of taking over their, their Zoom connection, disrupting things with, you know, whatever pranks hackers get into porn or loud music or what, what have you. Yes, that is correct. So uh, Ravens coach John Harbaugh was one of the primary voices of those concerns. And they were worried particularly about uh, Zoom bombing, which was happening right around that time. Uh, it was kind of the early stages 
of the pandemic when everyone was on Zoom and Zoom was still kind of ironing out their security posture. They've definitely done quite a bit to shore that up since the early part. And we haven't really heard too much about Zoom bombing since then. But uh, No, they've uh, they put some measures in place, which definitely have had an impact. I also remember this story concerning the sort of distrust at the time of the IT people going into the coaches' homes to install equipment and vice versa of uh, the IT people not wanting to catch anything from those coaches homes themselves so yep all correct yep they uh, really did pull off the draft with uh, without a hitch but uh, harbaugh was also even worried about online theft of proprietary information about prospects or even team playbooks just because they were doing so much online that was not normally exposed in that way right and as for an episode number uh, let me do some math in my head here <laughs> uh, i'm gonna guess episode 23 no oh, not quite 17 this not time dang. So, uh, yeah, tough to keep track of the numbers. I uh, do not begrudge you that. So, all right, this is the last question, and question number five is what I would call the most difficult one. What's my score so far? You are uh, two for four, so 50% right now. So, to go for the passing grade now. hardest question for last yes before winning the super bowl last year the chief's previous super bowl win was 50 years prior what cybersecurity document came out in 1970 that predicted many vulnerabilities that still persist today and i will admit to you that i had no idea any about any of this until i did the research for this question so don't feel bad um, let's see uh, network security for dummies <laughs> The Dummy series starting in 1970. I don't know when that started, but uh, it was actually the Ware Report by Willis Ware and a team of experts which outlined what were then more theoretical network weaknesses. The report was prepared for the Department of Defense as they were in the early stages of building the predecessor to the internet, ARPANET. So. Mm -hmm. What I found interesting about this was, though, that uh, a few of the key potential weaknesses that were identified before the internet even existed were uh, exposure or destruction of data caused by system failure or administrative mistakes. Never, never heard of that. Computer happen, crashes. Huh? Yeah. And uh, maybe some misconfigurations along the way. Attackers exploiting weaknesses in user credentials or software vulnerabilities. Oh. Sounds, uh, sounds like something we hear about now and then, too. And passive subversion, which refers to collection of data in bulk as it moves across the network. So and that's basically spying on people coming, uh, doing their thing online. So well, I'm glad we've got all those issues figured out over the years. Yeah. And so uh, there were some articles pointing out how if people had just listened to this report a little bit better, then maybe we would have been able to stop some of these issues from happening from the get-go, but who knows. The uh, other key statement from uh, from the report that also still rings very true from where the author of the report says, quote, providing satisfactory security controls in a computer system is in itself a system design problem, a combination of hardware, software, communication, physical, personnel, and administrative procedural safeguards is required for comprehensive security. So basically, he was advocating the layered security approach back in 1970 before there was an internet. So One day we'll learn. Yeah. <laughs> Thought that was interesting, though. Well, hey, I like this. We should uh, turn this whole show into a big sort of quiz show, like, uh, like we're on NPR or something. Yeah, there you go. Well, if you want to get me back with a quiz, maybe we'll do like a March Madness one or something like that. So yeah, we'll that's get you next month. not too far away. So if you're listening yeah. to this before the Super Bowl, enjoy it. And yeah. if you're listening to it after, this is not really dated in any way. So you can still enjoy it, too. And if you thought that we scripted any portion of this show, my 40 percent score should prove <laughs> that we were not prepared for this. At least I was not. <laughs> Time again for Ransomware Reckoning, in which our Firewalls.com colleague, Andrew Nita, shows a spotlight on ransomware, because unfortunately, that's not going anywhere. The numbers are in. Ransomware as a business boomed in 2020. Payoffs to ransomware attackers skyrocketed over the last year. We saw an increase of over 300% in the reported number of payoffs. The actual number, we fear, may be higher. It's been calculated that almost $350 million in cryptocurrencies were spent by businesses to their network captors. What is even more interesting is the majority of the amount made its way into very few hands. 80% of the 350 million spent in ransoms went to less than 200 cryptocurrency wallets. 
according to chain analysis. What does this mean for 2021? We foresee ransomware accelerating into a snowball effect. As these attackers receive more income, they'll continue to increase their attacks and invest into more sophisticated operations. If you haven't already secured your network, now is the time because the wolves are coming and you don't want to be left exposed. Stay tuned to the Ping Podcast for updates on ransomware attacks all across the globe. Now it's time for headlines. In this regular segment, we take a closer look at a few top stories in the cybersecurity world and talk about what they may mean to you. On to headline number one. Police dismantle world's most dangerous criminal hacking network. So international law enforcement agencies say they've dismantled a criminal hacking scheme used to steal billions of dollars from businesses and private citizens worldwide. What was the scheme that they dismantled, Andrew? Yes, so uh, this was actually the main infrastructure and web servers behind the infamous Emotet malware. You probably heard a lot of that in 2020. Uh, Mm -hmm. Quite a few articles and news pieces talking about it. Uh, So police from six European countries as well as the United States and Canada teamed up on a joint operation to uh, go ahead and take these guys down. Uh, I believe in Ukraine is where the actual infrastructure was housed, uh, and there were some images showing that sort of setup. Uh, I don't believe any arrests were announced one way or the other. though. No, and what was interesting is if you look at some other pieces about Emotet, the general thought out there was that they might be in Russia, so Ukraine, uh, not the place that a lot of people expected it to be. But it's eastern Ukraine, so getting closer. Very close, yeah. So anyway, according to the FBI, the Global Action allowed law enforcement to dismantle the foundational components of Emotet's operation, taking down multiple layers of infrastructure located around the world. Special Agent Jessica Nye with the FBI says, through the combined efforts of the incredible team of the FBI foreign partners and private sector partners, the command and control network of Emotet was dismantled, and to recreate this botnet, the criminals would have to rebuild from scratch. Right, and uh, listeners might be wondering how such a sort of big ransomware or uh, a malware threat like this Emotet was taken down by just a few web servers getting nabbed, but... You have to understand that Emotet was primarily used as a malware as a service business model. And so really this one uh, main infrastructure cluster was being rented out and shopped around to lots of different threat actors as a sort of rental service. Yeah. And so in the U.S. alone, more than 45,000 computers and networks had been affected by Emotet, according to the FBI. And Nye says the Emotet malware on those machines is no longer harmful to those it infected. It uh, closed off access to the malware that had opened to uh, millions of machines overall. So yeah, this is a this is a pretty widespread thing. Just getting back to what Emotet actually is or does is uh, basics are it's it's normally delivered via a malicious email attachment or link and is used by cyber criminals to gain access to a victim's computer before it then downloads additional malicious software like maybe Trojans to uh, steal banking passwords or ransomware could also be delivered via Emotet as well. Right, so it's definitely a foot-in-the-door type of service that lets in the bigger nasties later. Mm -hmm. Globally, Emotet is linked to damages estimated at about $2.5 billion, uh, according to authorities in the Ukraine. So Mm -hmm. uh, that's quite a hefty sum just for the one or two years it's been around. Yeah, very hefty sum. And uh, as you said, because it was basically just set up as a malware as a service situation, a lot of the people responsible might not have even, you know, been professional hackers to uh, the same degree that we hear about on other other types of busts like this. So Ukraine's general prosecutor said uh, police had carried out raids in the eastern city of uh, Kharkiv, as you said, eastern Ukraine. To seize computers used by the hackers, authorities released photos showing piles of bank cards, cash, and a room festooned with tangled computer equipment. So, uh, just like in the uh, the stock images. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know if there are uh, anonymous masks or anything yeah, there, there are too. Black hoodies hanging all over the chairs. <laughs> That's what the hackers do, I think. Yep. Uh, Germany's BKA Federal Police Agency said in a statement, Emotet is currently seen as the most dangerous malware globally. 
the smashing of the Emotet infrastructure is a significant blow against international organized internet crime. That smashing used in a police statement was a, a strong choice, too. Yes. Got it and slammed them, like the, the headlines like to say. <laughs> yep. So uh, is this the end of Emotet? We will have to see. Certainly had a large setback. Yep. But uh, it is a brand, so... You got to figure the the brand may recover in some <laughs> form or fashion. I like in this quote that they uh, they called this the international organized internet crime as like a, a meme mafia out there. Yeah. <laughs> now headline number two: Microsoft 365 becomes haven for BEC innovation. You hear the words Microsoft and innovation, and you'd think this story is a positive, but unfortunately, not so much. This is not the type of innovation that we like to talk about. Two new business email compromise, or BEC, tactics have emerged onto the phishing scene involving the mini- <laughs> Involving the manipulation of Microsoft 365 automated email responses to evade email security filters. Same manipulation three times fast. <laughs> manipulation of Microsoft. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think the uh, the real shocking aspect here is in the last clause of that sentence. It is made to evade email security filters. So this is a uh, sort of innovation targeting people that are doing everything right by having security email security applications in place. They've got filters set up. But these new sort of angles are made to go around that. So uh, the hackers are getting craftier as always. And uh, as such, we will have to match them in their craftiness. Yeah, I actually found both of these to be pretty impressive variations on, on business email compromise. So in one case, scammers are targeting victims by redirecting legitimate out-of-office replies from an employee to them. And in the other, read receipts are being manipulated. So both styles were seen being used in the wild in the U.S. in December, especially when autoresponders were more prevalent due to holiday vacation. In the read receipts attack, a scammer creates an extortion email and manipulates the disposition notification to email header to generate a read receipt notification from 365 to the recipient. Yeah, and when you get this read receipt notification, uh, unfortunately, it contains the body of the message. So even if your spam filter would have taken the actual message itself and exiled it off into whoever or who knows where those emails end up, I guess just the spam filter. But instead, you will see a sort of preview of that same message. So either way, you're effectively getting that phishing email. Yeah, uh, so it's uh, sort of an end around of the security because those will come through to you. The example in this particular article of the uh, read receipt email, the message subject even says, I have full control of your device. So threat intelligence experts say that uh, is kind of using a double whammy of the fear for an employee who may be opening that up. So that it'll make them respond a little more urgently to seeing that the read receipt comes through and the nature of the message. And so they might be sloppy and click link and then let the attacker come in. And the second form of attack focuses on the out of office notification system. Uh which a cyber criminal creates a, a BEC email, sort of impersonating someone else inside the organization, and then manipulates the reply to email header so that once the out of office automatic message appears, it replies that back to the target containing that BEC email that would have otherwise been stopped by the filter. Yeah, I like how they abbreviate out of office on this uh, particular. Yeah, it's the OO attack. <laughs> that uh, OO notification, which includes the original text yeah goes to another individual within the organization so graham cluley a researcher at bitdefender kind of explains this a little bit more with a real world example so he says the email may be sent to one employee but the reply to header contains another employee's email address so employee a has his out of office reply enabled so when he receives the fraudulent email an automatic reply is generated However, the out-of-office reply is not sent back to the true sender, but to employee B instead, and that's where that extortion text lives. Right, and so in both cases, the, the OO attack as well as the read receipt attack is using internally generated messages from your Microsoft 365 account to sort of 
sidestep these filters. Should we call the read receipt attack the er attack? Like the, er, the er new, new. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that that's appropriate, right? I, I think so. <laughs> Just to back up, BEC emails are designed to scam companies out of money. They are usually carried out by impersonating an employee, a supplier, or a customer in an email or mobile message, usually involving asking for a bogus invoice to be paid or for a recurring payment or a wire transfer to be sent to a new unofficial destination that uh, is in the hands of a hacker. So this is a little variation on both of those. Right, and business email compromise attacks have just grown exponentially over time. Uh, They rose by 15% quarter over quarter in Q3 of last year. Uh, And Office 365 has become a fairly popular target because not only is it a very popular platform, but once hackers have gained access, it's kind of a nice central repository of uh, emails, chat histories, files, uh, where they can sort of sift through a lot of raw data to learn more and perhaps craft even more effective BEC emails at a later time. Yeah, and they only need to get that access once. Like, once they're in, they can be in and uh, hanging out in there for quite a while, so... Kind of a double-edged sword that 365 has a lot of nice features and a lot of people are using it, but the reasons why a lot of people are using it are also reasons why the hackers are going to like it too. Right, so if you're going on vacation, be careful with your out-of-office attacks. Uh, This article, unfortunately, did not exactly provide a solution, but maybe (laughs) just send everybody a note that week that you're going on vacation and not to email. Yeah, and just knowing that this type of attack is out there should at least cause you to uh, give any of these a second look before you do anything. Right. Uh, Dot your I's and cross your U's. (laughs) Time for headline number three. U.S. court system ditches electronic filing, goes paper only for sensitive documents following SolarWinds hack. That was a long headline, but, you know, it made me think of uh, The Office. I've been watching a lot of Office reruns lately, even though it's not on Netflix anymore. But Dunder Mifflin would be thrilled about this. The U.S. court system has banned the electronic submission of legal documents in sensitive cases out of concern that Russian hackers have compromised the filing system. Right, an order was recently handed down to all federal courts that any documents containing information that may be of interest to intelligence services of foreign government will not have to be physically printed out and hand-delivered in a physical format. Uh, I'm a a little concerned with the exact definition for information likely to be of interest to an intelligence service, (laughs) but I'm sure there is a more precise uh, definition somewhere. Yeah, you would think so. And there are probably a lot of things that would be of interest that wouldn't necessarily fall in the category that they are probably aiming this towards. But uh, regardless, these particular documents that this category will then be uploaded to a computer at the courthouse that isn't connected to any network air gap, maybe. I right. didn't see that listed in the story. but And uh, lawyers will then have to travel to the court and to that computer to gain access to the docs. Don't know if they'll have to turn two keys simultaneously or something <laughs> to open the door. Right. So this is all uh, the fallout of the large solar winds hacks, which I'm sure you all remember fondly, uh, <laughs> in which re- it was suspected that Kremlin spies gained access to the networks of multiple U.S. government departments via a backdoor IT tool. Uh, And so the idea that highly sensitive documents may be uh, hackable at this point is very concerning. And so no more documents on the Internet. Yeah. Highly sensitive documents in this article referred to as HSDs. A lot of people like to abbreviate things. And it's like, you know, sometimes you don't really need an abbreviation. It's the office of abbreviations. fault. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, among those that were hacked through the SolarWinds attack, the Administrative Office of U.S. Courts confirmed it had been breached, which, uh, you know, goes along with all those other government organizations we've previously mentioned and a number of companies. It is not thought, however, that access was gained to the most sensitive U.S. court, which is FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. That one's more of an acronym than an abbreviation, but, you know, you get the idea. Right. So typically court documents like this are filed through the court system's electronic filing system and are sealed, requiring a specific set of logins. But uh, obviously those logins are no longer trustworthy. So this is definitely slowing down the whole process uh, across the nation and potentially sort of slowing down a lot of the very sensitive federal trials. 
Yeah. And so there's a little bit more about what the rules are in terms of what this applies to. So they are documents that typically involve national security, foreign sovereign interests, criminal activity related to cybersecurity or terrorism, investigation of public officials, the reputational interests of the United States, and extremely sensitive commercial information likely to be of interest to foreign powers. So You know, for federal cases, that probably does cover a pretty wide gamut of them. There are probably a few that would avoid qualifying in there, but you could probably make the argument for just about anything. You know, given the uh, the age of your average judge, this is probably uh, a welcome change for them. <laughs> this is like a throwback night. <laughs> yeah, you know, a lot of people have resisted going to electronic forms and things of that nature anyway. Maybe with a little I told you so at this point, too. Like, yeah, nah, nah, darn nah, nah, snappers. Yep. Yeah. Now, when all of the papers get, you know, dropped when someone trips in a puddle going across the street, (laughs) then maybe we'll go back to thinking the electronic way was better. But, uh, you know, (laughs) six of one, half dozen the other. Right. Thanks for listening to this episode of Ping, a Firewalls.com podcast. Check out the links in the description for more information about everything we discussed. Subscribe or follow now however you listen to ensure you get our latest episodes as soon as they're available. And please do rate and review us. Visit firewalls.com for all your network security needs and give us a follow on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. For Andrew Harmon, I'm Kevin Baxter. We'll be back soon with another episode. But in the meantime, we remind you to get get secure, secure, stay stay secure. secure.